so that we can have this available to us following. Um, you will, we're going to keep you muted because there are a number of people on the call and joining, but um, do, if you have questions, post them in the chat. And um, Tal, thank you for taking time out of your morning to spend the next 40 minutes or so with us talking about positivity in uncertain times. Um, I was reflecting on a, a teaching of Joan Borisenko's in one of our certificate programs where she talked about how the journey of transformation is the journey of a smile and that in time of change, we are held between what is no longer true and what is not yet true. We're in liminal space. I'm wondering if you might talk for a moment or two about what, where's the point of positivity in this liminal space where things have fallen apart, but the new is still emerging. Yeah. You know, I, I think it has to do with, um, with the process of change in general. And what happens during uh, difficult times, uncertain times, uh, such as these, is that the process is uh, taken to the extreme. Mm. And uh, everything, in fact, is taken to the extreme. Emotions are, uh, are, are extremely high and uh, difficulties, uh, um, pleasurable emotions as well. You know, so it's a bit of a, a roller coaster. And it's during such times that this process of, of growth is, um, is expedited. You know, you, you look at, um, let's take this, this graph and, and apply it to a lifelong development. You know, so we know the, the U-shaped curve of, of happiness. Right. that, um, you know, where people are generally doing okay early on in life and then they go down and then around, you know, 40s, late 40s, they're unhappy. And again, these are averages. It doesn't apply to everyone. They're unhappy and then they become happier. And, uh, you know, it's this curve-shaped, smile-shaped uh, process that, that they go through. Um, and the reason why people actually become happier later on, when, you know, when they get to the other side of the, of, of, of the smile is because they're more accepting. Oh. So we're more accepting of our uh, um, challenges and difficulties and uh, imperfections and even insecurities um, as, uh, as, as we grow older. And we, become to ex we come to accept reality more. And I think what is uh, happening also now or what needs to happen now in order to better deal with the situation is be more accepting. Um, so the macro process, you know, of a, of a lifetime also applies to the micro process of, uh, of, of what, what, what we're going through. I'm noticing that we have four young adults sheltering with us during this time. And one of them is in her early 20s. And she, does, she is having insomnia during this time. And I have insomnia too. And the difference between the two of us is that my insomnia doesn't torture me. It's like, oh, well, didn't sleep last night. I'll figure it out. Whereas she is tortured by the fact that she is not getting regular sleep. So it's just a minor example of this acceptance that you're talking about. Yes, ex exactly right. You know, um, when, when I think of, um, you know, my, my own trajectory over the years, it's not that I don't experience hardships, difficulties, downs uh, today. It's just that I don't make a big deal out of them. And, um, you know, that's the difference that, you know, Buddhists talk about it and more and more researchers today talk about it, uh, about the two levels of suffering. First level, natural, we all go through it, uh, part and parcel of being alive. Second level is when we reject the first level and say, well, I shouldn't be upset. You know, I'm an expert in positive psychology. How can I be experiencing anxiety? Um, and when we reject it, there is a second level of suffering. The first level is inevitable. The second level is a choice. Right. Right. One of the things I'm having a hard time with, Tal, I'm wondering if you might speak to this as well, because I know you and I are both in the Recovering Perfectionists Club. <laughs> and as any, I'm sure other people too have gotten the message that this is a time when we should be learning new things mm -hmm. or when we should be taking advantage of the solitude to produce new, more, or we should be cultivating new meaning in our life. And I just feel this incredible pressure mm -hmm. In, in when the world is so in a, upheaval to make something do you know what i mean are you experiencing that at all very much so you know we, we um our, our children are at a different age so you know i have uh, i have two teenagers and, and a younger uh, boy at home and the pressure i feel is seeing all the um um all the different kinds of uh, bread 
that parents are making with their teenage children. <laughs> uh, you know, all these recipes, and I'm feeling a lot of pressure because, you know, I make schnitzel. So, um, um, like, what, what is schnitzel? <laughs> it's, it's a Viennese, uh, um, actually, I do it with chicken, but they do okay. it with, uh, with something else. But in, anyway, very basic. So, um, um, you know, the point is that, you know, so many people are doing so many things and, it, and, and, and you're thinking, you know, what, what, what's wrong? You know, why am, why am I not doing uh, all those things? Why am I struggling uh, much of the time? And the key here, again, it's, it's you know, you, you know I, I talk about this in our, uh, in our, in our course, you know, I, I talk about the great deception Ooh. that, um, that, that, you know, on, on, on social media where, you know, everyone is doing great uh, except for me. Um, but it's that great deception that actually leads to the great depression. And what we need is, uh, what is full acceptance? Full acceptance is accepting reality. And reality is that these are difficult times. Reality is also that we always experience hardships and difficulties, that it's part of being alive. You know, reality is that um, being in the same, you know, household with the same people, and they can be the most wonderful and easygoing people in the world, that's challenging. Being alone is challenging mm. and it's accepting these rather than, than you know setting the bar high and saying well i should be this or that it's accepting these the, the reality that is the key for an easier not an easy uh path so as if acceptance is uh foundational for a sense of positivity mm. how what else might actually cultivate positivity at this time yeah, so you know, I've, I've been thinking over the last few years uh, about the idea of going back to basics, because really, you know, you and I, when we teach, um, it's no rocket science. You know, many of the things that we teach, you know, whether it, um, cultivating resilience or uh, increasing positivity, you know, they're, they're basic. The key, though, is to do them. So during this time, it's going back to basics even more so. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a quick example. So, um, Exercise. You know, exercise is always important. You know, that I, uh, I talk about not exercising is like taking a depressant, meaning, you know, it has the same effect on us as, um, as, as our most powerful psychiatric medication. So if we take exercise, you know, if I usually exercise three times a week, today I've upped it to five times a week. Um, if, um, you know, I do yoga usually twice a week, now I'm doing it also five times a week. Um, so I think it's going back to, or writing a journal, you know, if I would keep a journal, you know, once in a while, maybe once every other week, you know, now I do it regularly, um, you know, twice a week, perhaps. So everything going back to basics, even more so. So here's what happened when I went back to basics. I actually in, I don't know, it was day five or six of this uh, social isolation at home, um, sort of hit a wall. I kind of fell apart a little bit inside myself. And I actually got out my original SIP notebook. Mm. And I looked at all the notes from all the videos. And I made a list. Try this, try this, try this, try mm. this. And I, I was surprised that in those first, those first, that first week and a half, it felt like very little was happening positively. I kept waking up so sad and so overwhelmed and so worried and so confused and a little angry and um, my tools didn't seem to be helping. And then I realized they actually were helping in that they were structuring my day, in that I was reminding myself that I had choice and that I just needed to keep returning. It's like the great return. I just needed to keep returning to my practices until one of them actually started to light up and I'll Talk about that in a moment. Does that make sense, Tal, that the practices absolutely. aren't always going to feel good right away? Yeah, yeah you know, absolutely, because, you know, we're here for, uh, you know, on a journey, not on a, you know, one-off uh, uh, transformative experience. And uh, in a journey, you know, there, 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 there are ups and downs. So, and again, during regular days, not everything works every time. But, you know, as, as we often talk about, it's like... Um, you know, you're on a plane. You don't see the plane moving on the screen. It's only when you look, you know, three, four hours later, then you see, oh, I've, I've, you know, I'm closer to Europe than I was. We're talking about planes. Do you remember those days when we used to fly? 
house. I might actually enjoy an airport again in the future. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, so, you know, the change doesn't happen uh, immediately. The thing is, you know, to trust the process and to know that these things uh, um, do work when applied consistently. So, you know, you won't necessarily feel better right after you exercise one. So you won't necessarily feel better. Sometimes, in fact, you'll feel worse after you engage in a, you know, in a journaling uh, session. But in the long term, you know, this is, um, um, we need to go back. And, and you talked about, you know, going back to, the, you know, to having an anchor or a structure. Yeah. I think that's so important now because it's so easy to, um, to lose that, you know, when you can, uh, um, you know, get up in the morning and, um, and, you know, stay in your pajamas all, all day and, and basically have a day in and, and, day, and not, not even know what day of the week it is because right. it doesn't matter. So um, I think it is important to put a, a structure in place, whether yeah. it's with, uh, you know, if you're home with kids or by yourself, structure is key. Someone added in, thank you. Um, and we use coping skills not necessarily to feel better, but rather not to feel worse. You know, mm -hmm. to sort of hold, I think of it as holding the line, right? Yeah. Holding the line. Um, and thank you also for the link from Ottawa about um, why you should ignore all that pressure to do more. Lately, I've been finding myself when I'm teaching resilience saying good enough is really good enough. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah and it's, um, and you know, uh, you know, we, we started talking about how how, how this um, this period can expedite processes. You know, it takes people years to learn that good enough is good enough. And I think going through this, and hopefully it will be you know over soon. You know, in a period of few months, people can learn that lesson. You know, it's a little bit like you know, think about uh, you know going to the gym and. Um, you know, you, you, you lift weights in the gym and you can do it gradually. And, you know, after a year or two or three years, um, you actually get stronger. Or you can go into an intensive uh, program where, um, where you lift even more weights and then you get stronger quicker. There is a danger with that and you need to be careful so that you don't get injured. Um, however, this is expediting the process in the same way that additional weights would in the gym. Mm. Oh, I love that. Love that. And, you know, Marie, I wanted to uh, ask you about something. So, um, so I had a fascinating conversation with uh, um, with a colleague of mine about the idea of uh, anti fragile. So, this is mm -hmm. Nassim Taleb's uh, work from uh, New York University, and um, when he he distinguishes between resilience and anti fragile, and his distinction is interesting. So, for uh, resilience. You know, comes from uh, from engineering. Uh, you have a you, you have a, a material. You know, it could be a, a, a ball that you squeeze and it goes back to its previous state, or you throw it down and it comes back to the same height. You know, that is resilience. Anti-fragile. Um, again, I'm I'm going here by you know book definitions as opposed to what we mean by resilience. Mm -hmm. Anti-fragile is when you go through a hard process. You know, like you're you know being squeezed or you know going through hardship. And you emerge from it, not in the same state, but at a higher state. You emerge actually stronger than you were before. So, you know, if, if you have, uh, you know, the ball, when it bounces down, it bounces back higher than, you know, than, than where you dropped it. Or the material, you know, after you um, make it resilient, it actually becomes even stronger, it becomes anti-fragile, stronger than it was before. And I'm, and, and I'm thinking, is this what we always mean by resilience? going through a hardship and then coming back even stronger? You know, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger sort of thing. So I have a complicated response to that. Um, Bring it on. The, the older definition, the 1980s definition of resilience was that bounce we called bouncing back. So the ball would bounce back to its standard level of height. The metal would return to its standard level of function, right? Capacity. And then, over time, as positive psychology emerged, this beautiful frame of post-traumatic growth emerges, right? Growth through adversity, where we actually began to gather the data and the research that demonstrates that we are absolutely capable of becoming even stronger within and actually participating more fully in life during and following 
the harshest moments in life. And we're talking here about severe moments like loss of family members, brain injury, um, death of a child, trauma, tr first responders, et cetera. So this is where the research from uh, Columbia University and Bananos, you know, trauma and loss lab meets positive psychology. And there's this beautiful inter intersection of appreciating that we can grow through adversity and become, and to use your term or that term, anti-fragile. However, and here's where it gets complicated, in the experience, such as the experience we are in now, what we feel strongly, I'll just speak for myself, what I feel strongly is the fragility mm -hmm. and the longing to feel anti-fragile, the awareness that I don't feel whole or healthy or together or more capable in moments. So I'm very poignantly aware of the fragility and the new cracks and the opening of old cracks and the attempt of these habits and practices to sort of fill in the cracks with some the, the stronger metal, the gold metal, if you will. Um, so to know that in the process of becoming anti-fragile, you often feel quite fragile. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And um, you know, the question is, um, so how do you um, increase the likelihood that from this fragile state, and, and again, it's not just fragile um, in terms of your being weaker and potentially you could break, but you actually break. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, these cracks are real. Um, how do you uh, enhance the likelihood, if not ensure, uh, enhance the likelihood that you will emerge even stronger than you were, uh, than you were before? And I think one of the... Um, you know, as you were talking, one of the things that I'm thinking about is, um, you know, the difference between sadness and depression. Mm. You know, the difference between sadness and depression is that depression is sadness without hope. You know, depression is sadness without hope. And that goes to the work of, uh, you know, Marty Seligman on, uh, <clears throat> on being hopeless or learned helplessness, as he puts it. Um, and, um, and, and, and I think that if we have hope, during these fragile uh, states that many of us are in, if not all the time, at least part of the time, that um, we know that that too shall pass and that there is the potential for anti-fragility, meaning growing stronger as a result of this, or at the very least bouncing back to, to where we were before. And that gives us the, the strength to, you know, to pull through, uh, to go on, on. Because again, um, sadness, fine, that too shall pass. Uh, depression is a more um, difficult state to, uh, to come out of. Of course, possible. And, and you know, most people, most of the time do it. Um, but how do we remain in, in a relatively optimistic state, i.e. with hope? I think that is our um, biggest challenge. And one of the ways to do it is um, to for, know that we're not alone. Yeah. You know, there is a, there's a, a terrible... Uh, German word, you know, and, and, and um, you know, we also have a, a phrase, you know, in other languages, I know in Hebrew, there's a phrase um, similar to it called schadenfreude, mm. you know, which is basically celebrating the, you know, others' uh, misfortunes, uh, enjoying others' misfortunes. And um, it's, again, it's a terrible word. Um, having said that, now, when we see other people struggling, it's not that we're celebrating their, their difficulty and misfortune, is that we're feeling that we're not alone in our misfortune. And there is a lot of value there. That is, um, that, that is important. So I think one of the things that gives uh, people, can give people, people hope during these times is uh, knowing that you know, it's normal that, that, I'm, that I'm struggling. It's, yeah. uh, it, it, it's okay, it's fine, and that too shall pass. Yeah, yeah. Tal, uh, thank you guys for the reflections on fragility and vulnerability and post-traumatic growth. And Karen wants to know if you could share, again, just your concept of depression briefly. I think, I th and I, I'm just going to fill in the blank maybe here, Karen, that many of us are a little worried that our sadness is moving a little more toward depression than we're normally used to. So if you can differentiate, that would be great. Yeah, so, so once again, the difference between sadness and depression um, is that uh, depression is sadness without hope. You see, sadness we all experience, you know, sometimes 10 times a day during these periods for, um, for longer 
um, spells. Uh, but that's not depression. Um, depression is when you know, we wake up in the morning and, and we, we've completely lost hope. Again, not just once or twice, but you know, for, for a prolonged period uh, of time. And um, when we're feeling down, when we're feeling sad, if we're able to look at that uh, sadness as, first of all, something natural, and that's why other people's experiences matter here, because if I see you know, so many other people experience it, experiencing it, then I think, okay, so that's, that's normal. Um, and um, seeing it as normal and seeing it as temporary, meaning, um, yes, I may experience it today. I may even experience it this whole week because it's, you know, it's, it's a tough week. And I may even experience it until this coronavirus uh, is over and we f hopefully find, a, you, know, um, you know, a cure or, um, or we can be immunized against it, whatever it is. It's still temporary. And, um, and during that phase, it doesn't mean we shouldn't experience the pain. We should fully experience it. Um, and yet, knowing that there, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I, one of the things that's really helping me now is uh, reading poetry. Same here. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I've, I've gone back, actually, my, my whole family now is, uh, I'm rereading my kids for the first time, reading uh, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Mm -hmm. And it's so comforting because what, what poetry does is uh, it doesn't apologize for the pain. It doesn't apologize for the darkness. It doesn't apologize for the joy and the light. It's, it's, it's raw. And this is what we need to experience now. I can't believe you just said that because when I was talking about, I, was, I got my SIP notebook out and I went through every practice and it felt like the, when they weren't working. The one <clears> that I returned back to that has been sustaining is holding both the permission to be human and the permission to move a little bit more toward my better self, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit more toward my better self. And when I meditate on who I am at my best or my better self, I, sh I share love of learning language, poetry. Mm -hmm. I go back into the, and so I've been reading a lot of poetry and I wanted to, um, bring to you a phrase that I just heard from David White on Sunday. He's doing a, a global poetry thing. And he talked about how we are all each called to the bell, which calls us into the deeper inner journey of experience and the, our inwardness and the call of the black word, bringing, blackbird, bringing us back out into life, imperfect and, mm -hmm. and fully human. And in between the two calls, the bell and the blackbird, you know, it is our duty to show up authentically and, and cultivate the meaning of our lives in between those two calls. Mm. I love that. You know, in, in general, I mean, I love the concept of the in-between mm. uh, because in, in, in many ways we're in an in-between state right now, sort of in, you know, in a limbo, um, neither here nor, nor, nor there. Um, you know, we're, now we're, we're on, you know, talking. Um, we're together, but we're not really together. Um, and, um, and, um, it's, it's a good way to think about, uh, where we are, you know, this is, um, you know, right now we're sort of in the gym, you know, we're not out in the world, we're in the gym, we're training, you know, it's a way of re reframing oh. this, uh, the state that, that we are in and, you know, and in the gym muscles burn, you know, people who exercise hard in the gym, you know, their, their muscles burn, you know, they're out of breath. Uh, it's not the most pleasant uh, of states, but the reason why we're okay in the gym, because we know that it's temporary and we know that it's, it ultimately potentially can make us uh, stronger. So one of those great meaning questions to hold is what are we training for or what are we training toward, right? So hold mm -hmm. those questions. There's a question here from Patricia. There's so much talk about connecting, but I hate texting and on some big change that I'm on and I've cringed during every birthday parade I've had to go on. Can you talk more about being with yourself and what you do these days? Hmm. Yeah, so um, I'll tell you what I do more of. So every morning uh, I write. I've been writing, uh, well, I always write. Uh, a lot, but I've been writing even even more. Um, I read more than um, th than I did before. I read a lot of poetry. I also found that I'm reading uh, short stories. 
Um, it's difficult for me to get into a, a novel, though, um, though I will hopefully in the next uh, few days. But short stories are, are, are great for me now and I'm really, um, really enjoying them. So I just got, you know, the, you know, the 100 uh, best short stories of all time or something like that. And it has short stories from, you know, from the English speaking word in French uh, translated from, uh, um, from uh, in dozens of languages. I'm really enjoying, <clears throat> enjoying that. I'm also meditating, um, mostly through yoga and listening to a lot of music. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, I must say, I, I do feel like I need these Zoom calls, um, you know, even, and, and I'm an introvert, you know, I love being by myself, but, and yet I, I need uh, the, the, the interactions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, so we, we have four young adult kids with us. So I am back in mommy mold, mommy mode in a whole different way. We had you know, empty nest for a few years and, and now we don't. Um, so solitude seems super precious right now. Mm-hmm. And there aren't many moments of that between work and conversations I want to have with my friends in those Zoom birthday parties and the um, Zoom Seder, Zoom Easter, Zoom, you know, et cetera. Um, and I'm finding it's hard for me to settle, you guys, in the moments of solitude. It's hard for me to settle. And the most settled I feel in solitude is when I'm out walking in nature mm-hmm. that I, I am, I try to get out every single day um, to be to, in touch with a larger world that isn't talking to me or at me, but simply living the experience of its own, its own beingness that has been healing for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think nature is, is uh, playing a big role um, in, in people's uh, well-being right now. And, um, you know, I was just reading yesterday that um, in India, the, they can see the Himalayas uh, from some places for the first time in decades. Why? Because the air has become cleaner. Um, I, think, I think nature is talking to us. Uh, nature with a capital N. And, um, and, and it's talking to us through... Um, the fact that you know more animals are coming into uh, spaces where they weren't before, and it's also talking to us in our um, the 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 the, the um, solace, the comfort that we find uh, when we walk in nature. And again, you know, we know the research by Barbara Fredrickson and her uh, colleagues about. And again, we don't need the research. It's obvious that nature contributes to well-being. But I think now it's it's speaking to us. Uh, more clearly, you know, its voice is even louder. And, and I hope we heed that voice and don't forget it the day after. So um, when the story broke, which turns out to be fake news that the dolphins were returning to the Venice canals, I, <laughs> I sent that information everywhere because I was so excited that dolphins were swimming in Venice. And I actually started a conversation with my friends in Italy about how we could keep the Venice canals clean to keep the dolphins swimming. And the National Geographic Geographic posts its reality column saying, okay, here's real news. Like the turtles really are returning and the Himalayas we can see and there are birds in Wuhan, but there are no dolphins swimming in Venice. And I actually felt completely crushed. Um, But what I learned from that was this incredible longing mm. for this moment to be a, a moment of global reconcili- reconciliation with the earth herself. And that if we've learned nothing through this, that maybe what we learn is to leave space, leave the earth a little more gently, to treat it a little more gently and carefully. That there is a way in which COVID-19 could benefit global warming. Yes? I mean that yeah. maybe that's a fantasy, but I that's I'm trying to go there. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. I was just um, so last week I was thinking about this a lot, and actually r- wrote about this idea that um, you know the the internet, you know, chat rooms are 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 full of lessons we derive from this experience. You know, one of the lessons is to treat Mother Earth more gently, uh, to appreciate our you know family more, to uh, 
to uh, appreciate solitude and, and, and to slow down. You know, these are all very important lessons. I mean, we talk about them, you know, almost each time we, we teach and, 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 and now there are, um, you know, people are talking about it, how they actually learned it and are applying it and are deriving benefit from it all. My question is, um, will this lesson last? And if, if, and if you look at, you know, previous experiences and if you look at research, um, it, it mostly suggests that it won't. You know that after 9-11, um, after um, some of our colleagues, including uh, the late Christopher Peterson, looked at, uh, at New Yorkers and uh, how 9-11 changed them. Mm. And New Yorkers had become kinder, gentler, uh, more open, um, more, uh, more, more, more generous and benevolent. Um, for a few months Ugh. yeah and you know after a few months uh, they went back those who were kind before remained kind those who weren't uh, unfortunately were back to their previous uh, state so it, it it didn't it didn't last and also you know we know a lot of uh, of you know the hedonic treadmill and 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 you know the you know the spike in well-being uh, we know from a lot of research that it probably doesn't last and the question is how do we make it last how do we not lose these lessons that we are learning. And again, they, they, it may not be pleasant to learn many of these lessons and it may not feel good now, but there is potential for growth and development in, uh, in, in this experience, uh, or at least some lessons to be, to be learned. W will it last? And I, I hope it will. I really hope it will. The question is, you know, how? And, you know, I go back, we have to create rituals around what we learned. For example, a ritual around um, being in solitude uh, in nature or a ritual around uh, being home for dinner with, uh, you know, people you care about or going out regularly, even when um, we no longer have the, the, you know, the virus threat. So maintaining those lessons and it doesn't have to be every lesson our lives doesn't have to be radically transformed but you know as we know small changes uh, applied consistently can make a big difference i also you know love the notion of show up as you can where you can you know make having positive influence in your small community in your family in in the the kitchen table like show up where you can as mm -hmm. you can um, and but also find a longing in, in response to these questions about how are we going to do this, it, you know, and sustain change, find a longing to keep connected to communities of practice where we hold ourselves accountable. You know, Richard Boyatzis from Case Western has that beautiful term of resonant leaders, the mentors who pull, pull you forward into growth, but also hold you accountable for not sliding backward. You know, I think we're back to habit and practice and communities of practice. Yes. Yes. And these communities, you know, ideally face to face, but online communities uh, will do. You know, this is one of the great advantages of technology um, that uh, other people can hold you accountable through it. And even, um, you know, a recur function on your uh, daily planner can hold you accountable to to change. Yeah. Sue has a question. Um, I know she works in the territory of uh, pastoral counseling, and many of us are in what we might loosely call the caring or helping professions. And we're getting so many calls and emails from people who are not positive psychology students. And what's the one thing we can give to a layman, she asks, other than listening and inspiring words? What, you know, do you have a thought about that, Tal? Um, well, the first thing is, I would say, you know, it is listening. Um, I was, um, you know, if, if you look at what essentially people are asking you Sue, to, to do is to, to, to lead them or to be a leader, you know, whether you are a therapist or a coach or a, or a friend or, or, or a parent or a partner. Um, in these times, you know, what people need are, um, is leadership. Now, who are the greatest leaders? The greatest leaders um, throughout history have been, you know, what Robert Greenleaf uh, coined, the servant leaders. And um, the servant leaders are those, you know, if you look at an organization, are those that take the organizational chart and flip it upside down, where the CEO, the leader, is not at the top, but at the bottom supporting the rest of the, uh, the organization. Now, what is the number one characteristic of servant leadership? 
as pointed out by Robert Greenleaf, who came up with this uh, concept and, and, and many other researchers who came later. Number one characteristic of servant leaders, listening. Really being present. Listen first. I think that listen first should be our formal and official uh, battle cry, so to speak, during, uh, during these times. Whether we're managers, parents, uh, therapists, coaches, or whatever, listen, listen first. And then after we listen first, um, second can come, as you say, the, um, you know, the, the inspiring words that should be simple. Very simple. And, and, and simple means, um, are you exercising regularly? You know what a difference an exercise session or regular exercise sessions can make for dealing with the situation? Enormous. Uh, it can really make the difference between uh, make or break between uh, you know, uh, breaking or growing more, more, more resilient or, or anti-fragile. Um, keeping, keeping a journal, because you can't listen to them all the time. But self-analysis, as Karin Hornay pointed out, can be as effective or almost as effective as, as um, being analyzed by, by another, someone listening to us. Um, so, Again, it's, it's, it's listening first and then going back to, to basics. And, and when I say listening, it's not just passive listening, it's also uh, empathizing. So the last thing that, that people need right now is, is, is for them to hear, look what they're doing or look what I'm doing uh, and I'm experiencing this constant high. This is the best period of my life. Um, by the way, for some people it is, um, but that's not what people who are struggling need to hear. Uh, what they need to hear is that, yes, for most people, this is a difficult period, that they're not alone. And here are some of the things that can help. I'm so glad you just said that, because this has been a really difficult time for me. I feel like I've just found my footing in the last, last few days, but up until then, it was a tremendous amount of upheaval and worry and recalibration. And it felt like, you know, turbulence in a storm, like the storm just kept coming kind of thing. Um, and this notion of keeping it simple for yourself as well as for others is so liberating. It's so, like we don't have to be scientists or geniuses or, you know, Dr. Fauci to understand how we care for ourselves in this time to keep it really simple and use the practices that serve us. I'm wondering in the last few minutes, uh, two things. If you guys wouldn't mind posting, what's helping you now? Like one practice, what's the thing that's most helpful so we can sort of share each other's wisdom, but also invite any last question or two for Tal before we have to move on. Oh, the, gorgeous, the art of listening, walking outside. Testify always and sometimes use words. Oh, I love that. The journal, music, dancing, yeah. You know, um, so there's a lot, many people are, are writing here about uh, meditation and, and how helpful it is. Um, and, um, and, and it's true, meditation can be a, a great anchor uh, for people, especially who have been meditating. Um, I must say I've struggled a little bit with um, with meditation over the past uh, two months, and um, because I, I feel that more than usual, I mean, my mind always wanders. You know, that's the monkey mind. Um, but more than usual, my mind wanders, and I, to the point where I actually didn't feel like it was effective, and it was actually just bringing up more anxiety rather than uh, calming me down as it usually does. So what I've been doing much more of is uh, yoga, as I mentioned, because with yoga. Um, it's more challenging and more difficult, so my mind is less likely to, to wander. Um, and second, music. Mm. You know, you know my, my, my favorite uh, uh, author is Mary Ann Evans, uh, uh, a.k.a. George Eliot. And uh, Mary Ann Evans wrote back in the uh, mid-1800s, she wrote, uh, I would have no other mortal need if I had music in my life. And, uh, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, 1850s. So that, that was pre uh, MP3, MP4 era. <laughs> uh, today we have 
music constantly in uh, in uh, in our lives. And um, you know, just last week. So what we do around the house is um, we we take turns. Each one you know puts his her uh, favorite piece or the piece that they want to hear. So you know, my 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 son would put on Drake, the new Drake. Uh, um, single and and my daughter would put uh, the new Billie Eilish uh, single and I put um, the not so new overture to Tannhauser by <laughs> Wagner and you know they tolerate me they have to and they even you know secretly don't don't tell them I said it they even enjoy it um, and it, it it's 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 a wonderful thing to uh, to be able to to just draw on the greatest music uh, throughout history that's accessible. You know, the other day I, I sat for two and a half hours and listened to Clara Schumann. Um, just just breathtaking and beautiful. And throughout, you know, I smiled and I cried, and you know, it helped me uh, accept whatever emotion uh, came up. So music for me is now um, the most uh, effective form of meditation. Oh, so beautiful. Tal, when you listen to music, are you doing thing, other things as well or just listening? Yeah, that, that, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so I don't listen to me. Oh, I rarely listen to music as background music. When I listen to music, I listen to music. Um, you know, there are, there are various ways of listening to music. One way is to just have it in the background and, you know, once in a while you tune in. Um, Another way is to not even notice it. Um, and uh, the way that I, that I recommend is listen to it mindfully, meaning when, our, when we just focus on, on that music. And that's when music fulfills its potential. You know, it's when we go to the real or metaphorical concert hall, that's when we benefit uh, from, the, from the power of music. So Tal, we're coming close to our time when we um, are going to say goodbye. And um, I wanted to end, for you, music, for me, story, right? Mm -hmm. Which has always been true. And I wanted to end with a story that I shared with you years ago when we first met that I, I don't know that anyone else um, here has ever been, I've never shared it with anyone else. Um, and this actually gets to the question of, of cultivating meaning that is uh, in the chat. When um, I began to work with Tal and we began to teach in the Certificate in Positive Psychology together, um, I felt actually a, a kind of change in vibration in my being. I was so deeply engaged in something that I love and the kind of learning and the kind of community that I find inspiring and uplifting, but also challenging. And um, for about seven months, this, this was a time of, of greatness in my life. It felt great in every way. And then, then the first sip ended and everybody went home and the party was over and all I had was my notebook and, and maybe some Facebook chats. And I found myself one day really asking myself, how can I hold the meaning and that sense of growth and um, epiphany while back in normal life? And I was driving down a road and I got behind a school bus. And it was one of those school buses that stops at every driveway along the way to let out little, little ones like five-year-old and four-year-old and three-year-old. And normally I'd be completely impatient and pissed at myself that I was on that street behind that bus and couldn't get to where I needed to go. But because of your teachings, Tal, and because of our community, suddenly I began to notice how absolutely important and precious it was to have space and time for a door to open and a child to walk out safely back into the loving arms of the people there who could greet them. And that if positive psychology offers many things, one of the most beautiful things it offers us is the possibility of meaning in the ordinariness of our days, the meaningness of our connections, our rituals, those we are loved by, the possibility of being slightly better selves all along. I can't thank you enough, Tal, for being willing to 
join with us and share some personal reflections as well as the wisdom that we know is um, so rooted in, in your appreciation of science and love of learning and so on. Um, I will um, save this on YouTube and we'll post it and email it to all of those who, who are on my emailing, emailing list. And oh, maybe before we leave, we can just flood Tal with some thank you for all that he has brought to us um, so that we can keep nourishing and supporting him as he moves forward into this very strange, very beautiful, very weird liminal time. Thank you all. And I'll unmute you so you can say thank you out loud too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you for being Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Lorraine. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. <laughs>